What is up, everybody? Happy Friday. It feels like it's been yes. a hell of a week, a very long week. And obviously, <laughs> there are differences in tonight's episode of TNT. And they're not just skin deep. Uh, Derek can't be here. He is actually on his way uh, for a family trip to go see, uh, I think, his dad or his mom i i'm not sure i shouldn't speak for derek I but i know it was his mom but it was a family yeah. trip in general yeah he's he's on a family trip uh so we thought that this would be uh more of a chill episode tonight um we're, we're trying out some new things here at tnt there's a bit of housekeeping here for the beginning of the episode so i'll go ahead and start with that um the, but the very first thing the first thing i want to get to is i am honored extremely honored to welcome our good friend straight lace back to friday nights uh so this episode is sponsored by Straight Lace and his game, The Soul Woo! Device. Uh, the Soul Device is a puzzle platformer where the player can create temporary platforms by shooting projectiles onto walls at the cost of HP to navigate the environment. The game's third anniversary is on July 9th, and to celebrate, the developer Straight Lace is working on an update with new puzzles in a challenge pack. Completion of those extra challenges will reward the player with access to abilities such as improved health regeneration to help with the main game's harder difficulties. Additionally, after the challenge update, Straight Lace plans to work on a soulless difficulty, where the map will be redesigned to be more challenging and the player won't have access to the titular soul device, only the other unlockable abilities. The soul device is available now on steam for free and a new integrated speedrun timer is going to be added in an upcoming update or in the upcoming update which should be launching soon uh thank you so much for sponsoring this episode of tnt straight lace welcome back <laughs> uh fridays yes. have not been the same without you so we're glad you're you're uh back here and we're proud to be uh spreading the word of the soul device to uh to the gvg gang or the gv gang once again um with that, I realized that I didn't mention, of course, look to your left. I'm joined by my good friend and GVG co-founder, Ash Paulson. <laughs> like I said, we're, we're doing something a little different today. Uh, so the rest of the housekeeping that I had mentioned is that... Uh, Sorry, Steve, really quick. I oh, just yeah. wanted to let folks know that I that I pinned a, uh, a link to the Soul device oh, in our chat. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes. So go check that out for sure. And also, AxCon, I, I deleted your message by accident. That was not on uh, purpose. I apologize for that. You were uh, going to say you wanted to ask a question of Derek. Sorry about that, but he will be back on Monday. Uh, and I apologize for deleting your message. No, it was not on purpose. No worries. For those of you asking where, where the Derek cardboard car is, it's here somewhere in this in this drive. I just haven't had time to find it and uh, put it back into the fold. But I promise the, the Derek cardboard car will... will make its triumphant return as well as the ash car bed and the steve bowling car <laughs> so i i need to yes. find those images uh oh brandon thank you i'm i'm rocking a naruto shirt today uh that's for both my brandons as it were um but yeah we're, we're doing a little bit of a different show today so uh the quick bit of housekeeping i have is that uh y'all know that tnt for the last uh month <laughs> has been running pretty long. We've been doing like two hour episodes and that means that yours truly uh, is not on the post show as much as I would like to be. Uh, so we're gonna we're, we're trying to make some changes to the format of the show. Today's the first episode we're gonna try that in. Uh, we're taking our news stories down from eight to five. Uh, I have a feeling today with just me and Ash, we're probably gonna fit well within the hour that we dictate for TNT, but the goal is to make sure uh, that we can get everyone onto the post show, including our guests, uh, you right. know, and, and be able to be there for the entirety of that show and not shortchange y'all when it comes to, you know, the, the extra content that you're paying for. Um, let's see we, uh, before we continue, man, I don't know how to say that. J it's JC one. Say what? It won. It's oh, won. one with five Canadian dollars. Yeah. Just, gotcha. It's just straight up one. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the Canadian $5 <laughs> super chat says, read my essay message in the Patreon chat or in the patron chat. Uh, speaking of which Juan says, Oh, Hey, can y'all stop scrolling for just a sec? <laughs> it's, it's passing me by. I, I found I will... it. If you need me to read it. Uh, it? yeah, if you could, please. Cause okay. I'm... So Juan in our Patreon exclusive live audience chat, thank you for the super chat, by the way, Juan says, Hey guys, sorry. I've been absent this week as I was out of town, but I got two things to say. One at first I was saddened by it, but after seeing it in motion, the Shantae me costume is the best costume in the game. Sakurai did our girl justice. Two, can you please give a shout out to Hellfire Comms' charity stream as they are raising money for children's hospitals starting tomorrow? I'll leave a link to their fundraiser in both chats. Well, certainly shouting that out. That's a great, yeah. uh, absolutely fantastic cause. And as soon as I find the link, which you just posted, thank you, Juan, I will post it 
in our YouTube chat. Where I'm doing it right now. Thank you so much, Juan, for the uh, for letting us know about that and for the super chat. And I agree, Shantae is is absolutely one of, if not the best, me fighter costume in the game. And she came with a music track, so even better. Yeah, I uh, I, I'm I like Shantae. I'm a casual Shantae enjoyer, as it were. Um, and I did I I do appreciate the level of detail in her me costume. I think it is a cut above most of the rest of them. Um, Although I did see a horrifying abomination in which our good friend Kitty Kong Fax uh, oh, put no. the put the oh, Shantae no. costume on his Kitty Kong me, and it was a uh, it's nightmare fuel. Uh, I, I saw Shantae's body with Sans's head, which was equally horrifying, for sure. Uh, and I, I saw another one. What was it? Uh, I think it was Shantae with Dante's head. Shantae's body and Dante's head. <laughs> Shantae featuring yeah. Dante. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Heckle with a five pound super chat says not here live. So I'll catch this later, but here have some monies. Keep on keeping on. Well, thank you. Um, and you know, feel free to watch this, uh, later on on the VOD version and hear us read out this super chat, which is impressive that you did it not being uh, live. Um, I know, right. Or, or listen to it on podcast services later on. It'll be up tonight, uh, on iTunes, Spotify, all those good places. Uh, or if you're a patron, patreon.com slash GV gaming, we have an exclusive audio feed there as well. Uh, so a million ways to consume TNT and we love you no matter which way you do it. Um, Hell yeah. thank you so much for the five pound donation. Waffle King with a $9.99 cent super chat just says fat stacks with dollar signs on either side. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. yeah, thanks. I mean, Fat I stacks are the you. best kind of stacks. Unless exactly. you love emulating Android games, in which case, I guess blue stacks are the best kind of stacks. Ooh, that's true. Did you get blue stacks installed, Ash? I have not yet. I'm still just trying to... The, the list a... of things to do is always endless, but I'm, I'm trying to get around to that so I can try Mega Man X Dive. That is okay. I only found my Android phone today, and I was like, oh, I should nice. charge this. <laughs> so I will, yeah. I'm also working on getting around to Rockman X, or Mega Man X Dive. Uh, right. Anyway, so we've got a few stories to cover. We're going to take a little more time with the stories today than we probably normally would because the flow will be a bit different today. So I'm going to yes. go ahead and just start with this first story. And uh, this one's kind of bittersweet for me. And that is that uh, Nintendo has started a new series, Ask the Developer. And it right. might look a little bit familiar. <laughs> um, so this is, stop me if you've heard this one before, a series in which Nintendo sits down with the developers of popular games, asks them to give some background on the creation of that game and some anecdotes behind the process. You might say <laughs> that it's a little reminiscent of a former series they had in Iwata Asks. And yeah, uh, it, it, it's, I think it's Ask Iwata, wasn't it? Was it Ask Iwata or Iwata Asks? I think it's Iwata Asks. I guess it was Iwata Asks, my bad. Yeah. yeah. So, um... You know, obviously, this one doesn't have a host, and I think that's probably the smart move here. Uh, they intentionally do not talk about who's asking the questions. And I think that's right. because Nintendo is cognizant of the fact that Iwata is irreplaceable. You, you can't just slot someone else in and, and have them take his place. So. Yeah. Um, but I think they also see the value in asking, uh, you know, kind of pulling the curtain back a little bit, as it were, on their creative process and on the games they make. Um, this particular one is about Game Builder Garage, and it seems I'm, I'm a little surprised that that's what they chose. Uh, not because Game Builder Garage is not fun or it's not, you know, it's not an interesting title to talk about, but more because Nintendo does seem to be marketing Game Builder Garage quite heavily for what it is. And right. I, I don't know that that's... I, I don't know. I don't see a lot of buzz around Game Builder Garage right now. Personally, I'm still I enjoying it. I'm working my way through all of the lessons that are in the game because they do take time. And and it is one of those ones where I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do the hour and a half long lesson all in one shot because I don't really like doing part of it. And then coming back and trying to remember what it is they were trying to teach me. Um, because it is, I mean, the further you get in, like right now I'm at a point where they have me making my very first 3D game, like my first Ooh, three dimensional okay. game. And I'm like that uh, this one, I think clocks in at 90 minutes. And I'm like, e I don't, I don't really want to want to get halfway yeah. through that and then have to go make dinner and deal with the kids and then forget what the hell, you know, because they quiz you on it afterward and you have to pass the quiz to get to the next lesson. 
Um, wow, I, I didn't know that about having to pass like having to pass a quiz in order to be able to get to the next chunk of content. That's a bold decision. It, it really is. <laughs> I'm I'm a bit surprised by it. Um, but they you know they kind of go in and uh, this one, I feel like it's definitely interesting. Uh, and there there is some some fun information, but this one feels a bit more marketing driven than I would say. I mean, let's be clear. Iwata asks was definitely marketing driven. They didn't just do it out of the kindness of their heart. They did it to, you know, deliver some kind of interest in games they're working on. And they would often, you know, for me, my favorite part of Iwata asks was always when they would talk to folks that are senior at Nintendo and ask them about the olden days and stuff that they worked on in the past and not so much whatever game they were trying to sell you on. And unfortunately I don't really see that in this particular uh this particular uh ask the developers but i'm hopeful mm -hmm. that this series will continue i mean i would love to see one about of these about a game that perhaps is more dear near and dear to nintendo fans hearts like skyward sword yeah. hd i'd love to see one on which we'll talk more this about was... later in the show this was an interesting game to debut this this series on, and I do think there will be more because this is literally called Ask the Developer Volume One, right? Which suggests there will be Volume Two and going forward, uh, and and perhaps the next one will be about Skyward Sword HD. I certainly wouldn't be surprised to see one about Metroid Dread sometime going forward. Yeah, uh, and oh, that's man. another game we're talking about later in the episode, uh, in, in kind of a similar way where they we got the second Metroid Dread report. So, uh, I, it is an interesting game to kick this series off on, but. I'm glad to see something in inspired by Iwata Asks return. Uh, it, it's a nice way to to you know kind of keep his memory alive. I mean, his memory will be kept alive no matter what. Of course, he's Iwata, but it's, it's it's nice to to keep kind of something that was associated with him, kind of reviving it in in a new form. And uh, certainly, nothing will ever replace the original Iwata Asks. It's impossible. Nothing can ever replace Iwata himself. As you said, Steve, he is utterly irreplaceable. But this does carry the spirit of that series. And I like that. I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that it's cool that Nintendo's doing this. I, I appreciate that they have gradually, and, and I say that like in the most minute sense, but they have gradually become less opaque as a company as the years have worn on. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine. I, I look forward every year now to Nintendo's GDC talks where they, I mean, they pull back you know, show show uh, games at very early stages, much more so than uh, I would expect. I would have expected them to say ten years ago, even. You know, when we saw concepts for Splatoon, where they had blocks of tofu, and then eventually rabbits, and then uh, other stuff mm -hmm. like that, or even um, I think they showed off. I, I recently retweeted this, but at GDC one year they showed off like a weird in-between step between the Game Boy Color and the Game Boy Advance, like a prototype Game Boy that they never ended up releasing, but that was uh, something that they had fully, you know, built out in, in between those. Um, and I, I feel like Nintendo does, does probably did their best at being kind of open and transparent, as, as open and transparent as Nintendo can be uh, under Iwata, because Iwata was you know, one of the very few corporate CEOs that also understood the actual work being done in the trenches at Nintendo. You know, he understood what the day-to-day right. -day of the people working for him was. And I think that, you know, it's not a slight against uh, Furukawa or or anybody else that has held that position, but uh, I do think it, it lends a certain spirit to the company to have somebody who understands the plight of the developers, who understands the creative process and understands what we as consumers would find intriguing about that, you know, being able to right. suss out like what the interesting bits of game development are and what could, you know, get people more interested in your game by showing the things you maybe didn't do or even the challenges associated with what you did accomplish. But, uh, right. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to see this back. I think that, you know, this is probably not the volume I would have started on, but I also understand that right. Nintendo probably is is not getting the sales that they would like to get for Game Builder Garage. Uh sure. I think part of that is due to the highly technical nature of the game 
and the other part is due to the lack of uh, discoverability functions within it. Because even as someone who is yeah. playing Game Builder Garage, I have a hard time finding other people's games to play. I have to go on Twitter and just look for them. Right. And well, that's what I was going to say. Is like it, it, you know there are there is an, a specific audience for this kind of game, like you know kind of like Super Mario Maker that appeals to people who want to design their own levels. But the difference there is that Mario Maker and more particularly Mario Maker Two make it very easy to play other people's creations where and, and i'm that kind of player i love platformers i love mario i've made a few levels but I've, i'm not really the creator maker type and i just have found out that i don't have the time it takes to, to make good levels really and <laughs> so you know but so i consume other people's levels you know i'm, I'm just a dirty mario maker 2 consumer uh <laughs> but with with game builder garage you know i would actually be down to to purchase it if i could more easily consume other people's creations i want to see what people are creating but i don't want to make my own games and the fact that this doesn't really you know include an easy way to discover other people's creations is kind of unfortunately what has stayed in my hand because otherwise i would have picked it up so I can yeah. check out other people's creations. I know you were uh, you've been playing this with your daughter, I think, Steve. I wish I could check out what she's making. You know, oh, hey. and <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been trying. You know. I've been trying. Uh -huh. uh, I've been my, trying. Okay, fair my enough. my daughter loves the concept, but I don't think uh -huh. she likes the execution. Like when I told her, "Oh, okay. we could make this," she's like, "All right, well, I guess you can make that, <laughs> and I can play that." Yeah. So she's very much your type, I think. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. But she saw me. She's like, oh, I can't wait to see you play this. And, you know, she sees me with a mouse like I'm at work and just clicking and dragging stuff between things. And she's like, this doesn't look like a video game at all, Dad. What are you doing? Right. <laughs> so right. Uh, I, I definitely didn't land the way I hoped it would with her. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I, as a technical person and as a dork, am, am enjoying it. And I keep thinking, like, okay, I'll get through these lessons and I'll get to free programming and I'll start to figure things out. I, I want to recreate Mario 1-1 in this in Game Builder Garage. Oh, I think nice. I could do it, but yeah, it'll take time. It'll definitely take time to do yeah. that. But you I know do what? like that. Oh, go ahead. That just, just despite the fact that they started this series on a game that maybe we wouldn't have chosen... I like that, you know, even though it's Game Builder Garage, this is a really extensive interview. Like, I've, I've been is. kind of browsing through it and kind of just skimming through it. It's really long. There are three whole sections, maybe four whole sections, four whole parts, actually. Um, and there's, it really goes in depth. And there's stuff here that you would find out in, in an Iwata Asks. Like, it, I think it's really cool to find out that Nodons were apparently inspired by a Japanese pop idol groups. Yeah. Like, what? That's so neat. Like, Which I, is... That's something that we would never would have figured out without this interview. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. that's so cool. Like, I yeah. look at them and I'm like, I don't understand that. But <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've been playing yeah. the game. I'm like, pop idols. All right. I mean, I guess yeah. some of them I could see it, but many of them... like and they I confirm... Mean, Sorry, go ahead. Retry is just like a regretful old man that tells you embarrassing <laughs> stories that he wishes he could forget. So <laughs> that's so dark. Um, and and like they also tell us what we all already kind of knew and figured out ourselves anyway. But that it was uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, Labo VR inspiration behind Game Builder Garage, and and that uh, you know there's a lot of uh, it was informed by the Nintendo Labo VR kit and the VR Garage and and uh, stuff like that. So you you could tell because there's yeah. There are certain aesthetic similarities between the two, but it's cool to get that kind of insider developer track about the creation of these games, even a game that neither of us probably would have started this series on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is cool info here. If you have an interest in game dev or more specifically Nintendo, you know, and, and want to see behind the scenes, this does give you a good view of that. Um, it, it is a lengthy read, so it may take it may yes. take a while to get through it. Uh, but what will not take a while? is waiting for the release of this next game. Oh, we actually have a couple of super chats. Oh, though. I'm sorry. Let's let's get to those yeah. real quick. It's a, it's a Friday. Yeah. We're all we're all a little off. Anyway, uh before we continue with this story that is now on screen, I'll just leave it there. Y'all can digest it for a minute. Uh we have <laughs> a $19.99 super chat from Klaxoned, which says if I had a dollar for every dollar I ever stole, I'd have well Two dollars. The one I stole and the one I got for stealing. I don't promote stealing in any way, though. The guilt and timeout isn't worth it. Anyway, I'm finally back. Did you go to jail for stealing that dollar? Um, I know, right? <laughs> but thank you so much for the uh, for the super chat, Claxon. We appreciate your generosity. Yes. Glad you're We're back. Glad to have you back. Yeah, yeah, glad you're here for a Friday. It's your gateway to the weekend, really. Right. Um, 
so I am I'm happy to have you here. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing's with a five dollar super chat says. Please put a JPEG of Derek on bottom box. I'm working on it. I unplugged my controller. I'm I'm working on it throughout the episode. Trust me, it'll nice. happen. All right. Um, Timzel with a ten euro super chat says, "Yo, GVG gang, super glad I'm able to catch another stream again. I finally got a full time contract at my job, which I'm super happy nice. with. So here's some money to celebrate. Love you guys. Cheers." Well, love you back and Cheers. congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Cheers indeed. That's so that's really great Friday news in particular. I love that. All Hell good yeah. vibes going into the weekend all around. And congratulations to you, man. That's awesome. Yeah, that is that is awesome. And I'm glad to hear you love the job. So I mean that to yeah, me is that's, almost that's what's more most important. important. Yeah. Yeah. So uh really quick, I, I've seen a, a concerning message from someone I don't recognize in our live audience patron chat. Some dude named Bitnerd says, can't watch, but man, I miss that Derek guy. He's the best. Wow. I don't, I don't recognize Bitnerd. How did you get in our, into our community, man? I like, you know, that's, that's Patreon exclusive. I'm not sure how that how that worked out. Yeah, of man. course I kid. That's that's Derek. We love you, man. We miss you. And uh, we're looking forward to have you, having you back on Monday uh, or Wednesday. We haven't decided if we're taking Independence Day off, I guess. Um, but either way, we're looking forward to having you back and have a great time with your family, man. Yeah, absolutely, my friend. Go home and be a family man. Yeah, or, or go away from home and be a family man. <laughs> but yes, or that. Either way, yeah. Yeah. be a family man wherever you are. Anyway, yes. uh, and, and safe travels, my friend. Uh, we'll, yes. we'll try to hold down the fort in your absence. All right. Super Chat's out of the way. And by the way, we read Super Chat's between every story for those of you that are new here. Uh, and this next story, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, not going to lie. I gathered the news today. I put this in here for me. I'm super hype about this. Oh, and yeah. it comes out on my birthday. So... Yeah. Even better. Yeah, they did so, it for you, man. Exactly. The PlayStation blog announced that uh, Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut is arriving on both PS5 and PS4 on August 20th. And it includes a host of updates. Uh, the Director's Cut moniker, though, could not be more apt in this case because they actually include Director's Commentary, which I find... I, I don't know how that works in video games. I feel like that would be... A tough sell for me personally um just because i mean ghost of tsushima for those of you that have not played i mean it's kind of an open world game so you can kind of go anywhere do whatever uh and i just don't know like what 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 kind of commentary do you get from a game director as you're like riding a horse through <laughs> through tsushima you know yeah. like, that grass was real hard to render <laughs> I think that's, that, that's something I would only want if I'd already finished the game. You know, for me, when I'm playing a game like Ghost of Tsushima or many different games, I want to be immersed, right? I don't want to be pulled out of the experience with, by anything, let alone, you know, developer commentary, which is why, like, this this seems like something I would rather do once I've experienced the game in its entirety. I know what to expect. Then maybe I can focus a little bit more on ancillary content like that. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in this because I have uh, beat the game. It's actually my first platinum that i right. ever got on a playstation title um well platinum implies playstation but you get the point <laughs> it's the first platinum yeah. trophy i ever got and uh i'd be curious to play this i've been playing a lot of ghost of tsushima legends on my thursday game nights with my uh, friend nick and this carries over so the ps5 version includes haptics uh a dynamic 4k resolution which i'm kind of surprised about like i figured uh, because the PS4 Pro, which is what I originally played Ghost of Tsushima on, I was under the impression that that did uh, dynamic 4K. Like, dynamic meaning, for those of you that aren't aware, is like, it's kind of like what the Switch does, where it throttles down the resolution when it needs to. Uh, right. You know, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a perfect example of just how low that throttling can go. Um, yeah. So, PlayStation games, for a long time on the PS4 Pro, have done the same thing to hit that 4K target. But by and large, the PS5 actually manages real 4K, like, you know, without resolution changes. Um, it, so, But apparently, Ghost of Tsushima must be more demanding than I thought, which I guess kind of makes sense as a late-gen PS4 game getting ported to the PS5. Um the, the two things I'm most excited for, though, is that they announced, well, three. They announced that we're getting haptic feedback on the DualSense on PS5, which, hell yeah, yeah. every game that has that, and, I just... Oh, and ahead. adaptive triggers. Not just, haptic, not just haptics, but adaptive trigger support yes. as well. Yes. Which is but, where you get me. Yeah, the adaptive trigger support 
in in first party games has been nothing short of stellar. So I'm really yeah. excited to see how Ghost of Tsushima handles it, especially because it is a very bow and arrow heavy game. So I'm I'm anticipating that feeling pretty good. One of the big things for me because and I got ripped to thread or ripped to shreds for this when I reviewed the game back on GX. Like I I pronounced the character's name, which is Gene Sakai, and everyone's like gene like an old guy no. name like gene and i'm like no uh. like a japanese guy <laughs> named fucking gene and uh -huh. and everyone's like it's gin and i'm like mm, stand you know stand down dude right <laughs> but um right. the thing that annoyed me uh was i played the game in japanese but the lip sync was set to english mouth movement so right. it was like it was it was weird playing a game that featured nothing but japanese people speaking japanese synced to english mouth movement so they they're introducing japanese lip sync which thank god <laughs> it, it is it is immersion breaking to see you know a bunch of feudal era japanese samurai you know with their mouth not matching up with their native la language um but finally we're also getting an expansion as well which is the iki island expansion which if you've followed ghost of tsushima there have been rumors for the last couple of weeks about it ghost of ikishima which shima just means island so folks were right that rumor was correct iki island in japanese would be ikishima uh so i i think it's pretty cool i'm i'm pretty excited for this i'm not sure how hyped i am to listen to the developer uh commentary or the director commentary but i'll definitely try it um mm -hmm. If you already own the game, I think it's like a twenty dollar upgrade on PS5, or you can just buy ten, or you can pay ten for the DLC. Um, oh, I appreciate that. I, yeah. I was going to say because, like, I, I have it on PS4. You and I played uh, some Legends together, Ghost of Tsushima Legends together back uh, on GX, uh, Steve. And so I'm like, man, I, I only played like the first three or four hours of the campaign, and I really already liked what I played, and I want to finish it. But now we got this PS5 version, and I know there's like a PS5 like upgrade patch and i could just play that version but you get me at the 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 uh adaptive triggers and the haptic feedback like that's oh, yeah. i feel like i need to own this version of the game now and i was like man do i really have to drop 70 on a game i already owned the the, la the, the last gen version of but fortunately as you just said it's only 20 bucks to upgrade to this so i, I, I was wrong about that so oh, well, <laughs> I, I was kind of sort of wrong it's 30 here. bucks <laughs> Uh, okay. So okay. so it's twenty nine to upgrade from uh, where I got confused is apparently if you own the PS4 standard edition the the existing mm -hmm. PS4 version you can upgrade your existing PS4 copy to the PS4 version of the director's cut for twenty bucks okay. but if you want to upgrade from the PS4 version to the director's cut on PS5 then you got throw it. ten additional dollars on that so it, it goes right. up to thirty. That seems which, fair. Yeah, it's like a ten dollar premium for upgrading, and I don't think that is yeah. all that bad. And it, even if you want to baby step it, which I think is kind of cool, you can pay the twenty bucks to go from regular to directors, and then if you get a PS five later down the line, then that upgrade from PS four oh, directors to PS five directors is still just ten bucks. Which I right. definitely appreciate. Yeah, that's. I mean, yeah. I, I guess my my one you know I'll play devil's advocate here. My one uh, point of caution is. Like, is the upgrade going to be big enough to to make me want to spend thirty dollars? You know, especially for me. You know, I didn't. I beat the game. I did everything there was to do. Um, but I, I would say bundling an expansion probably helps make that feel a bit easier for me. Uh, you know, if it was just the four K and the lip sync, I'd be like, well, I already did everything there was to do in the game, and I can still play Legends with my friends on PS Four. But I, a whole new island sounds interesting. I just wonder how much gameplay there right. is in that island. Um, it sure looks beautiful, though. That one screenshot on the PlayStation blog post of all of the purple trees. Like, man, oh, what yeah. a beautiful game this is. And that's nothing new, of course, but it's, just, it's really strikingly gorgeous. And uh, one thing I do want to highlight that's kind of buried at the bottom of this post uh, and that I really appreciate is that there is going to be a free patch available that all players will receive a free patch that includes some new accessibility options for alternate controller layouts, as well as the option to enable a target lock on during combat. Target and as lock you all on know, is so huge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and alternate controller layouts, as you, you know, anyone who's followed GBG for a while, you all know that we're all about accessibility here. Everyone should be, you know, should, should get to play and enjoy games and anything that developers do to, open their games up to more potential audiences is, 
you know, a great thing objectively in our opinion. So oh, absolutely. Accessibility is always a good thing and hell yeah for them not locking that behind a paid upgrade. That that specifically is a free patch. I really appreciate that. Agreed. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the and and I do want to mention that uh you Narukami in our patron chat did did mention that at least, you know, it's not full price whereas with Judgment even if you own right. the PS4 version you had to buy the whole game again, which yeah, not a great look. Um Nah, that's really not. Yeah. Uh, moving before we move on, we we have more game improvements to talk about, but uh, we have a few super chats. Uh, we have a ten euro do or ten euro super chat from Hyrulean one thousand, and I always get confused. Is it Hylian or Hyrulean? I think it's Hylian. I I always thought I, it was Hylian, but I have seen both, it both yeah. ways. Yeah, that's I, true. But I, yeah, I never thought about it seeing it both seeing both turns. But I, I've always said Hylian personally. Yeah, like but it I, also might be one of those things where it's been both. Hylian got drilled into my head with Ocarina of Time because I am ninety percent sure the Loach was called the Hylian Loach. Um, right. But then I, I swear to God, I have also seen Hyrulean in game, like in other games. Right. So I don't know. But either way, I mean, whether you're a Hyrulean <laughs> or a Hylian, we love you all the same. Um, and Hylian or Hyrulean 1000 says, uh, glad I was able to finally catch a live show. I'll listen to it tomorrow properly as I'm heading to bed after a 13 hour shift in healthcare. Wow. Jeez, Props to you man. for that. It says yeah. also thanks for your E3 coverage, even though it was a month ago. Well, thank you for not just thank for listening much. and watching, but for taking care of people for a living. Yeah. I for mean, your service in the front lines of this pandemic. Like, thank you so much. And, and, you know, props to you for everything yeah. you're doing and we are, putting yourself in the line of fire. Yeah, you, we are not worthy. You are you no. are you are a brave soul, and I commend you for everything you do day to day. That is awesome, and something that frankly yes. I don't have, I don't have the heart for it. So I am uh, I am deeply proud of you, and I'm deeply proud that someone as cool as you listens to people like us. So <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And Thank kind you. of related to this, before we read the next super chat, I just wanted to uh, give a quick shout out to Wandering Clouds in the YouTube chat, who says, "I'm stuck in bed because of COVID, but at least I can enjoy a TNT episode today." I just wanted to say we're so sorry that you have COVID, that you're stuck oh in my bed. Gosh, we hope you yeah. feel better. Yeah, just stay safe. We hope you feel better soon. Get better yep. soon. And we hope the next time uh, or one of the next times we see your name in the chat, it's that you're telling us that you've recovered and that you're better. So, yeah, uh, we just hope, you know, wish you all the best, man. Absolutely. Um, following that up, Alligator Cosplay with a 10 euro super chat says, you guys have done so much to broaden my taste in games over time. From Steve with FF7, Derek with Dragon Quest, and Ash with Okami and Mega Man, you've truly elevated this nice. hobby for me. Thank you. Well, damn. Well, I'm, that's if, awesome. That's such I, high praise. Thank you. It really is. Thank you. I'm I'm glad I could turn one person on to FF7. I, I never knew that yeah. I would be the person that would someday <laughs> get someone else to play FF7, but I'll take it. I'm I'm happy that you uh that that you're able to uh enjoy this hobby we all share more because of uh watching yes. GDG. And uh stay tuned. We'll be recommending a lot more games as time goes For on. Sure. And um, I'm always happy to welcome more Okami and Mega Man uh, fans into the fold. So absolutely. Uh, next time I need now I need to start talking to you about Kingdom Hearts, Rhythm Games, Hatsune Miku, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Thank you Don't worry. so much, Alligator Cosplay. That, it's a deep rabbit hole to go down. Yes. Um, our good friend and frequent Super Chatter, Bongo Lover, with a Canadian $5 <laughs> Super Chat says, Steve, you missed one achievement for Ghost of Tsushima, the one where you got to fight the samurai in Danimal's armor. I mean... That's the most important achievement. Yeah, it really is. I mean, yeah. I don't know how I would be able to fend off a tsunami of yogurt-obsessed monkeys without it. So um, I feel like we're looking at another uh, another expansion, like Ghost of Danima, maybe? Or, or, yeah, <laughs> Ghost, I'm not sure. Ghost of Danima. I'll have to workshop that one. Danima, <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll have to workshop that one a bit. Oh, this is interesting. So Klaxon with a $1.99 super chat says, Hylian is a race. Hyrulean is a nationality. Man, we're getting deep hmm. on the Zelda lore here in the chat. I, I mean, I believe you. I, I just, yeah, I've never, I've never gone through the effort of looking that up or, uh, but I guess it makes sense. Like I said, I, I do remember hearing both sense. in game. Yeah. Um, so, wow, uh, nothing, nothing's with kind of like an interesting, possibly backhanded compliment. Uh, yeah. $5 super chat says, Ash, my mom walked in and said, you look very handsome, like a policeman. Um, um well, I can, I can assure I, you that Ash is not a cop. 
<laughs> no, I, well, I, I appreciate the first part of that very much. Thank you. Please tell your mom I said thank you. That's very kind of her. Also, earlier in uh, in the, the chat, I, I noticed you said nothing, nothings, that Ash is a god. I promise you I'm not, I, I, but I appreciate your kind words. And uh, yeah, but but if you ever meet me, you might be disappointed to find out I am, in fact, human and, and not a deity but thank you to both you and your mom for the kind words <laughs> nice all yeah. right well uh we, we that last super chat definitely shifted the tone of things just a, just a little <laughs> bit sure uh oh, but man. let's go ahead and uh throw throw our next uh story on screen and this one i'm pretty excited for because uh, nintendo released a new trailer for skyward sword essentially outlining all of the uh, quality of life changes that they've made to the game, uh, could basically confirming a lot of what we hoped for and expected uh, from this port, which is coming in just a few weeks. Um, right. The big one, as you can see on screen, is optional help from Fee. Is it Fee? It's Fee. Yes. Right? Yeah. I've always, which, I think I've always said Fi, but I, I never. Exactly I, I've always sure said Fi too, but I'm pretty sure it's Maybe Fee. Because I, yeah, I, I know that. One. Uh, but they show off the button controls too, which I'm going to be honest. Seeing them in in action, I'm like, not nah, not for me. I'm I'm going to go Joy-Con all the way. Yeah. Uh, but to be fair, I was also someone that on the original Skyward Sword, I loved the control scheme. Same, thank you, Internet High Five, because oh, you yeah. know I may have had issues with Skyward Sword, but the motion controls were not one of them, and I never understood folks who were like. It doesn't work, or the, the the rolling bombs doesn't work, and I'm like, maybe it's got something to do with your setup. Because all I can say is, for me, the motion controls worked super well throughout Skyward Sword, and that was probably my favorite part of the game, other than you know, like the music and the, and the narrative. And so I completely agree with you, man. I'm glad the button controls are there for people who want them. Again, accessibility features, great. But I'm if and when I replay this game in in the HD version, I'm going motion controls all the way. Oh yeah, I mean, I I'm. Right there with you. I'll be playing this Joy-Con in hand. But the other thing I really love is that they introduced uh, skippable cutscenes. Uh, yes. They no longer have the issue with the item descriptions being reread to you thank every single time you quit the game. Which, thank God or thank yeah. Hylia, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and they confirmed, which we've all been long saying, is that they dramatically improved the frame rate. So... Uh, the gameplay is a lot smoother. Hey, look at that. So, That's the big thing for I, me. 60 FPS in this game is going to be great. Normally, I would not read Super Chats out of order, but this is highly relevant to what we're talking about right now. Uh, oh, nice. Our good friend Brandon Bovia, manga letterer, ex expert on all things Japanese, uh, with a $5 Super Chat said, I just looked it up, and Fi's name in Japanese is Fi, which is spelled out in katakana there. And so he says, so at least in Japanese, it is Fi, F-A-I. So, yeah, I do remember. And that was where I started pronouncing it Fi because I've, I've played most Zelda games in Japanese just to get them like a little bit early because that's just uh -huh. that I have a sickness. And um, I, I that's how I learned how to read her name. And, you know, again, I, I had that drilled back into my head with Hyrule Warriors because she, again, is presented as Fi in Hyrule Warriors. Um, right. But I do understand, or at least, you know, I've been led to believe that in the West it has been fee, uh, you know, which I don't know. Which I'm good. I, either I way. don't know. I, I like Fi more personally, just because I don't know. This is kind of a, a tenuous connection. But for me, I just always in my own head, I'm like, you know, when I think Fi, I think, you know, Wi-Fi, you know, like technology and, and Fi herself has kind of like a, you know, technology-esque design with her color like neon blue and like i said a very tenuous oh, connection yeah. but that's just kind of what i always go with and i'm just well, like she, Fi. to me she always seemed like a robot of sorts like yeah she seemed, exactly like, like, i mean almost robot-esque yeah, yeah she, her her nature was very android like uh right when she would appear in the game and so i always thought like oh yeah fi like it to, i mean again same kind of link in my mind to where it's like i would never consider like a high-tech thing to be called fee also just fee sounds yeah. weird to me and you know i think of money when i hear the word fee um yeah true so yeah it was just kind of a kind of a bizarre setup but i am glad to see that skyward sword is is looking good uh you know up until breath of the wild release skyward sword was actually my favorite zelda game I just, uh, I, I have a lot of love for it, and I couldn't really uh, explain, you know, 
uh, what it is about. I think it's because it kind of revisited in a very small way the RPG light elements of Zelda 2, which was my first Zelda game. Um, and I, I kind of liked that about it. But I do agree that it has many, many flaws. Um, but I, I like to, I'm glad to see Nintendo at least addressed kind of the most, uh, the most annoying of them, right? In terms of just, you know, Fi or Fee, whatever you want to call her, her constant talking. Um, constant. Yeah. Like every, <laughs> it felt like every couple steps she had something to say. Um, yeah. You know, the, the frame rate never bugged me too much because it was on the Wii and, I wasn't really looking for super high frame rate, super smooth oh, gameplay sure. on the Wii, but I am glad to see it's improved. Um, and I'm glad to see, you know, we talked about accessibility earlier. Button controls for some people are going to make the game far more accessible. I remember having conversations with differently abled friends at the time of Skyward Sword's release and them saying, I just can't play the game. I'm incapable right. of swinging my arms for that duration of time or, you know, I'm uncap incapable of doing that in general. I have, you know, folks with limited mobility, stuff like that. Um, so I am glad to see that, you know, you can you can at least somewhat replicate that with the right analog stick. It's not for me, but I'm glad it's there for people who either need it or just want it that way. Um, exactly. But yeah, the rest of it, I, I mean, I was already sold on this. Zelda's one of my favorite series of all time. I'm absolutely picking this up. Same. Um, you you weren't gonna unsell me on it with any trailer, so uh, exactly. But, I mean, it's Zelda at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. It's still gonna be a great game, even if it's not your favorite game. I always I always say this about both Zelda and Mario: is like the worst Mario or Zelda game is still better than most games. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like you know I I have taken a lot of heat in the past for kind of you know somewhat trash talking Twilight Princess, and it is true that that Twilight Princess is my least favorite three D Zelda. But I always try to follow that up with, but still, that means it's still better than a lot of other games out there. So, you know, Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword, neither of them are my, are my 3D Zelda, but they're still both great games in a vacuum. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Couldn't yeah. say it better myself. All right. Our top story is coming up soon, but we do have a couple of super chats here. Uh, I'm going to start off with Rencon uh, with a 500 Philippine peso super chat, which... Thank you. That's incredibly generous. Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, they say, hello, GVG crew. Today from where I am, which I'm going to assume is the Philippines, uh, is July 3rd, my birthday. And I'm very happy to celebrate it by giving you guys my first ever super chat. I'm always happy to hear from you guys. Love you all. And regards to Derek. Well, thank you so much. Happy birthday. Um, yes. I hope you happy have. Happy birthday, indeed. An awesome, awesome day, and I hope that uh, I hope that your your birthday is filled with joy and games and whatever else you want it to be filled with. Um, yeah, and thank I'm glad you that we get much. to share a, a part of that day with you, however small. So uh, thank you so much for your generosity and for the super chat, and we hope you're enjoying the show. Yes. Uh, oh wow, Tim Timsel with a two pound super chat says steve out there with the top of the zelda tastes uh i've got to say that is the <laughs> first time i've had that reaction to uh to mentioning how much i love skyward sword i actually wrote right. on my kotaku blog back in the day a uh article that was that was titled why skyward sword is the best zelda game and it was my first experience with just the internet <laughs> dogpiling on me <laughs> like, oh, no. just a bunch that, of people pretty... that were like you're an idiot let me list the ways that's uh, definitely an uncommon take and and uh i mean as as i said i do think skyward sword certainly has its merits and there are things i love about it but i you don't hear that very often that that someone's favorite zelda is skyward sword but I, that's why I think you should shout it from the rooftops. Even if it is an unpopular opinion, it is your opinion, man. And you, you know, you're uh, entitled to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is we all love games, but we're all going to have different opinions on them and that's okay. Everyone has, has things they like. Everybody has things they don't like. And as long as you're civil in how you express those opinions and, and those disagreements, then, Hey, we're all here to have a good time. Uh, speaking of those opinions, Skull Kid Tiger with a five dollar super chat says, "I got called lame for loving Skyward Sword and Sonic 06, yet Steve loves Skyward Sword and Ash thinks Sonic 06 is a good game. Come on, we all have good takes." Okay, I want to just set the record straight here. Skullkid Dragon <laughs> Tiger is trying to spread some misinformation about me. I want to make it very clear. I do not think Sonic 06 is a good game. I don't know where this started. Uh, I appreciate the ridiculousness of it, and it's always going to be the Sonic game where 
you know, a human woman kiss Sonic to revive him from the dead. It's always going to be that. And there is, I don't, it's not good. It's something, but I don't think Sonic 06 is a good game. <laughs> Thank you though. Skull get tiger <laughs> yeah. for, for the donation. Be that as it may. Thank you. Uh, and it, NAX Ethan, is it Nax, Nax Ethan? Sorry, Nax Ethan. I, I need to remember that. I apologize, Nax Ethan. But Nax Ethan, with a $2 super chat in Japanese, says, uh, Steve Uto Ashu wa Nihongo Hanasimas, which is Steve and Ash can speak Japanese. I just did, uh, so well, all right. Part of that is true. I, I, I can speak enough like basic Japanese to get by when I visit the country, which I can't wait to go back again. But I just mean the bare minimum. So no, Steve can speak Japanese. I just know, you know, I'm like I'm like that person who's like watched a lot of anime and, and picked some up from that. But I also know that that's not how you're supposed to learn Japanese. That that's like <laughs> colloquial Ash Japanese and not proper Japanese. So don't. I, I would love Japanese to see history. Ash just running into like a local shop in Japan, spouting <laughs> off just things he heard from Shonen and. <laughs> Thankfully, I have never done that and never will. I, I use the bare minimum conversational Japanese I need to get by, which often isn't enough in, in, in more uh, traditional places like Kyoto. Tokyo, I can get around pretty easily, but Kyoto, uh, I need to step up my game a little bit, although I do love it there. I can't wait to go back. Nice. <laughs> Brandon Bovia in our in our chat. Ash at the post office. Kisama. <laughs> I <w> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> chocolate chocolate cake, which uh one of our famous uh bathtub donors is uh with back with a two dollar super chat says, Are you an otaku too? Uh I I probably <laughs> qualify. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, I absolutely qualify as an otaku. Pr yep. Strong and proud, man. There's n nothing wrong with being in, being an otaku, and I certainly think I qualify as one. I love, look, I love Kingdom Hearts. I love over-the-top anime. I just finished watching Gurren Lagann. How much more otaku could you possibly get? I mean, yes, I certainly, certainly am. <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, and yes, it is a Metal Gear line. It but, is a Metal uh, Gear line, yes. Yeah. We, we understood the reference, but either way, we're going to take it seriously. Yeah. All right. Speaking of things that should probably be taken seriously, uh, let's move on to our top story. This one is wild, y'all. So this comes from Bloomberg, <laughs> and I just posted the headline here, Robin the Xbox Vault inside a $10 million gift card cheat. Uh, so this was an interesting... Uh, this this was an interesting story to, to read. Uh, this was essentially about just a lone Microsoft engineer who was responsible for testing things involved with uh, gift card purchases. And this engineer discovered, and I recommend read the whole story at Bloomberg. So I'm just giving you the cliff really notes versions. Uh, this engineer discovered that when they were setting up to test uh, in-game purchases with gift cards and stuff like that, that it was generating codes worth real money that actually worked uh, as we would call it in the IT world in production, right? Usually, uh, so what I mean by in production is this guy was generating codes to just test purchases with, and if he had given those codes to someone he discovered, they would work on a retail Xbox. And this happened every time he tested. So he, he decided like, Hey, I'm going to print off a $10 code and see what happens. I'm going to, I'm going to go sell that $10 code to someone on the internet. And then mm -hmm. it worked and nobody noticed. And so he kind of office spaced this thing where he started just shaving codes off the top. And over, I, I think they said it was two years that he got away with this. And in two years, he generated $10 million worth of Xbox gift card codes and sold them. This guy, and he quit his job and bought a, they said it, a house that was in the seven figures of worth and was buying like a jet ski and like a, a winter home and all this other stuff. Uh, when he got caught and, and sent to jail and I think he got sent to jail for nine years, but I mean, this guy essentially just uh, was, was creating codes like printing them off or whatever, and then selling them for Bitcoin and then reinvesting the Bitcoin into other stuff. So he became a multimillionaire off of all these stories codes he stole from work essentially and i gotta say that like, plans to buy a ski chalet a yacht and a seaplane yeah <laughs> this yeah, guy and it was already living in a lakefront home this guy was phil spencer rich like he was living in a seven figure home like seven figures so that means north of a million dollars for his house and on top of that like ash said ski chalet 
seaplane. <laughs> like, this guy was living a whole ass life off of Xbox gift cards. Uh, it's not often that you hear about white collar crime like this in the video games industry, but I do find it interesting because they mention in the article that this guy at one point was selling so many gift cards that he was responsible for fluctuations in their value. Like he would, I mean, I want to know. And and again, I, I read most of the article, but I recommend going to Bloomberg to read the whole thing just because it, it is a brilliant piece of reporting. But I really want to know how many this guy was offloading that he could literally make $10 cost less than $10 <laughs> like that. Is... Right. Well, yeah. And, and the thing that gets me is like, I, I guess maybe I, I've heard that, that when you commit crimes like this, sometimes you you start feeling invincible, that like you're never going to get caught. And I, I, maybe that's what happened here, but did this person not think that they were going to get caught eventually? Like given what they were doing and given the, the magnitude and the, the massive scale of the crimes being committed here, did they just not assume that, yeah, they're not going to live in that lakefront home for the rest of their life. That this is going to end, and it did end two years later. It only took two, uh, you know investigators two years to cut you know catch up to this guy, and I find this point particularly salient due to that. Um, it says in the article, friends remember him as a clever but average student. A report card shows he received a C in finance, and here's the important part: and a D in risk management. Yeah, you think <laughs> is you should have managed that risk a little bit better, or maybe just not done it in the first place. Because now you're spending nine years behind bars. Was it worth it? Yeah, I that's mean, that's the really weird thing. Is like, why would you go through all this trouble? You know, to yeah. I mean, I get it. I I definitely understand to a degree, right? You work for a giant, faceless, soulless corporation that has their own invented currency of sorts, like. Mm -hmm. They're just like, oh, you know, well, and, and you have the means to literally print money. And so I get the temptation, like in a weird way, like, oh, hey, this multi-billion dollar corporation has given me the keys to the kingdom in a in a weird roundabout way. And to a, it's relatable to an extent, like I'm like, all right, you know, most people, most people could probably make their lives measurably better with. $10,000, right? Like, let's just say $10,000. Like, I guarantee you, if somebody handed me $10,000, no strings attached, I could I could improve my life in, in various ways with that $10,000. I'd be out of debt, Same. you know, or, or something, right? Yeah. Um, I could invest it in crazy gear for GVG, make everyone's setup perfect, right? Uh, 10000 goes a long way. But, I mean, the... I. I, where I disconnect from this story, where I where I start losing the plot, is did you need ten million dollars? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like what what part? Like I feel guilty when you know I find like a twenty laying on the ground, and I I don't know who it belongs to. You know, like I'll look around, <laughs> I'll try to figure uh -huh. out like is there a way I can track down the owner of this money? I couldn't imagine the kind of. Uh, existential dread almost that would come with knowing you you lifted 10 million dollars off of anyone from anything you know that's the thing i would live every day in fear yeah like, that, that i was gonna get caught like i would i don't feel like i'd be able to enjoy any of this amazing stuff that that he bought because i'd just be terrified every day that people are looking for me that i'm gonna get caught and sent to prison for much longer than i've had this money and that's ultimately what happened yeah, I, I love this, too. By the way, when they caught him, he had a list that was titled How I Will Manage My Next 10 Million. And it was just a wish list of more shit he was going to buy. Four million for a house in Maui. One million dollar for a house in the mountains near a ski lift. A house in California. A house on Mercer. Like, this guy wanted to buy a house everywhere, it seemed. <laughs> like, you know, people are going to wonder how a former Microsoft uh, low-level... <laughs> Uh, engineer or contractor managed to manage to amass this kind of wealth and buy all this crap. But all right, yeah, yeah. Just... Well, and and later on in the story, it, it actually says there were indications. Uh, Kvashuk, I guess that's how you would say it, uh, was stressed. Web search history suggests he was trying to quit alcohol and looking into acquiring a Canadian visa. Uh, and apparently, a quote attributed to him is, "If they will start tracking me down, I will just bail." So clearly, 
he, you know, he had some knowledge of of the scale of crimes he'd committed, and that he wasn't going to get away with it. That he, that you know, and even if he did, let's say he did get away with it. Either way, you are living the rest of your life in fear. At least I would be. Maybe, maybe oh, he wouldn't be, but it sure seems like he was living in fear. Well, the funny thing is, too, you have to know to a degree that you are fucking with forces well beyond your control. <laughs> like, I mean, these are the same yeah. companies that, you know, put an Australian hacker in prison just for looking at plans for a new Xbox. I mean, that guy de definitely did not cost the company millions of dollars. He just leaked information about the 360 on the internet. Uh, he didn't ransomware them, didn't do anything. He was just an idiot who, you know, decided he was going to hack Microsoft and then leak the things he found. And that guy went to prison. I was like, if, if, and if there's one thing corporations love more than their information, it's their money. <laughs> and for him to literally just be stealing millions of dollars from them, I, I don't know, man. I would have been terrified. I wouldn't yeah. want Microsoft's well, lawyers coming after me. Yeah, and they were already on, on the hunt by February 2018. And, of course, this is exactly what happened. They, you know, corporate investigators trace irregular activity to two internal test accounts assigned to employees on Microsoft store team. Because of course they did. Did they? Yeah. Did he not think he was leaving an obvious trail? Like that's what I don't get. It's like the the wanton lack of regard for personal risk. You're clearly going to leave leave a trail. Um, the investigators learned that that the two accounts had already gobbled up almost eight million dollars in codes that were being sold on on black market sites. Uh, they blacklisted the two test accounts. Then immediately, I love this, only for a third account to begin buying codes a few days later. And that account had the password store one, two, three with store being the dollar sign. That is. Wow. I can't. I can't. Really? What, what astonishes me <laughs> is that Microsoft did not have some kind of system in place where testing these did not involve generating live codes that would work outside of Microsoft. Like, mm -hmm. you know, as someone who designs and and creates test environments for a number of things in, in my real outside of GVG life, I would never do this. <laughs> like, I would never yeah. be like, you know what, just test it in, in the same production system we use for everything else. Like, if I was in charge of, like, I would fire the hell out of anyone who designed this. I'd be like, you are very bad at your job and you need to go now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but I, I mean, it, it's a wild ass story. Go to Bloomberg, read the whole thing. It is, it is incredible. Yeah. I tried to post it in the chat, everybody, but unfortunately the link is, uh, is too long, uh, for the 200 character limit in chat. And I've been busy kind of skimming through the article instead of making a shorter link, but, uh, but definitely check it out. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we have one last story to go. I don't think we got any new super chats in between. So I think we don't believe so. Oh no, we did. We did. We did. did we? Okay. Sorry okay. about that. Yes. Uh, we got two. Uh, so we have oh, a okay. chat from SX08 uh, with a $4.99 super chat it says, what would be the best way to learn Japanese and got a promotion at my job? Well, one, congratulations on the promotion. That's Congrats. always awesome. Hell yeah. Uh, that is great news. Uh, second, Japanese school, school, 100% go to school for it. Uh, I, uh, my my journey into learning Japanese, and I'm not fluent, I'm just good enough. Uh, my journey started as a young kid, uh, literally trying to figure it out on my own. Big mistake. <laughs> that you know, It just led to confusion. Uh, but when I was in college, the very first class I signed up for was beginning Japanese. And that opened, opened it up for me so much. Just... Uh, Having, having the ability to sit down uh, with with a native speaker. You know, I was fortunate insofar as my Japanese teacher uh, was a Japanese woman who, you know, was born and raised in the country, which made it that much easier uh, to understand. And she did a great job explaining uh, grammar and as well as, you know, how to speak properly, how to use honorifics, when to use them what age groups it's appropriate for and the cultural connotations of both using and not using them, um, which was very, very helpful. So I would recommend if you're of college age or if you're at a high school that offers a Japanese language class, start there. Having an expert to guide you along the path 
will help you immensely. I took it for three years and I've continued studying on my own since then, but definitely seek out somebody who can, who can teach you the language. I, I think that their apps like Rosetta Stone and stuff like that are really good, but they're no substitute for an actual, like just class. Mm-hmm. Um, Klaxid with a $4.99 super chat says, <laughs> Bokula die weeb des, which I mean, yeah, I'm a huge weeb. I mean, I don't know. Maybe... I mean, I think we both are. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, he also captions that with, you know, it's true because I didn't even use Kana, which to be fair, that is, that is a turbo weeb move. Romanji is, uh, right. Is the, uh, weeb, weeb, uh, Japanese language printing of choice. You know what? It isn't I, I, I think all three of us honestly oh, yeah. qualify. I think you could easily find at least 10 reasons. All three of us individually qualify as both otaku and weebs. Oh, like, absolutely. Completely. Absolutely. And I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can attest to that. I, I agree with it. Uh-huh. Totally fine with it. Weebs fucking rock. Otaku rock. Hell yeah. All right. So for our final story. Wow, we're we're closing out. We're gonna have a post show, folks. All right. So for our final final story, uh, Metroid Dread Report Volume Two is dropped, and it's all about PlayStation Five. I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> it's about Emmy, who I personally believe resembles a PlayStation Five in a weird, I can see that. unsettling way. Yeah, um, like if your PS Five like came to like like could transform and come after you. God, now every time, thanks, Steve. Every time I look at my PS Five <laughs> in my entertainment center, I'm gonna think about that. I never made that connection. <laughs> That's terrifying. It's gonna get up and chase you around, <laughs> right? Maybe maybe it's just uh, Nintendo's subtle jab at Sony, but yeah, uh, yeah. So this one is all about Emmy and Ash. I'm actually gonna throw this one to you, man, because I got to look over this, but I haven't read it in full. And I understand you've taken a much closer look at it than than me. So why don't you break down uh, what was in the Dread Report Volume Two? Uh, well, as uh, you know, as it was suggested, this is really all completely about the Emmy, and and they go you know into detail about stuff we already know, as well as a few things we might not have. Um, of course, story wise, we we were kind of reminded that, that the Galactic Federation dispatched several Emmy to the uncharted planet ZDR to research whether the X-Parasite actually was uh, eliminated completely in Metroid Fusion. Um, But soon after they were dispatched, the Emmy on planet ZDR went dark. Uh, And of course, when Samus goes to visit the planet uh, subsequently, she encounters the Emmy only to find that their behaviors and intent have been corrupted, apparently, and they're now coming after her. The part that gets me and it makes me laugh uh, is that the transmission from the dev team or the first one here says the Emmy are robots that belong to the Galactic Federation. So they are not ordinarily an enemy of Samus. Respectfully, have the dev team played Metroid Fusion or Metroid Other M? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they have. I'm being I'm being, you know, facetious, but the Galactic Federation are trash by this point. They are known to be trash. They are known to not, you know, to not necessarily have the galaxy's best interests in mind. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily the case that you can just say, oh, yeah, they belong to the Galactic Federation. So they're not. Yeah, enemies definitely not. Of course, they, are, they, they could be. Um, so I think the most interesting part for me here, gameplay wise, is that Emmy and we may have already known this, but they go into a little bit more detail. Emmy are confined to specific Emmy zones, which means that they're they're not constantly stalking you. Um, they're, they're, you will only encounter Emmy in, in specially marked areas that are denoted by special Emmy doors that they cannot pass through uh, to pursue Samus outside of them. So Emmy cannot leave Emmy zones and pass through those doors. However, those doors are locked down uh, when an Emmy has sighted Samus. So you do have to shake an Emmy off your tail before you can leave an Emmy zone should one you know, catch sight of Samus. Uh, which I see is both a good and bad thing. Uh, the, the developers say that it would have been too tense and too scary and too stressful to have it such that Emmy could pop up at any time and anywhere in the game world. And while I can see where they're coming from, this kind of rem- uh, reminds me of a game like, uh, I think it was like Silent Hill Shattered Memories, where to me at least, a lot of that game's tension was sucked out by the fact that Monsters would only come out after you when it started. I think it was uh, when the when the areas around you started freezing, or when there was like a snowstorm or something. Yep. So the game was telling you, essentially, when monsters were going to be pursuing you, which kind of took the element of surprise out of it. And and I don't think that's going to be n- as big an issue here. Uh, but I do go both ways on that in terms of how I feel about 
you knowing exactly when and where an Emmy could possibly be pursuing you. How do you feel about that, Steve? Uh, I'm I'm kind of with you in that it definitely robs the game of some tension, it feels like. I would... I think, you know, one of my favorite ideas for games like this is that, you know, you never know when you go into a room if there's going to be an Emmy there or not. Or you could be in the middle of exploring an area and an Emmy pops up and you've got to do what you need to do to get away from it or kill it, right? Um, I wonder how they denote Emmy zones on the map or or if they do at all, right? It, it might be better if you, if you don't know that you're about to enter an Emmy zone, but then as you backtrack, you'll probably... You know, you'll you'll become familiar with the map, and you'll be like, "Oh, yep, there's going to be an Emmy in this room." Right. Okay, I just got to make well, sure. Well, I, that... I know, I know that the Emmy zone doors. Once you once you know, learn to know what an Emmy zone door looks like, you're going to know that you're oh, passing through. Oh, gotcha. So, so there is a visual the indicator that you're yeah. about to. Yeah, Audoodle says they're marked with pixelated doors. That I don't like. I don't like that one right. bit. Like, I feel like it's okay to have Emmy zones, but they mm-hmm. need to at least on your first run through be not clearly marked so that you know because there is that sense of i get that metroid is not a survival horror game i get that it's not supposed to be super scary but i think it's okay to have tension and and a bit of well and the thing is they're i mean the game is on dread (laughs) yeah and i mean and they've talked about how the the name dread is derived from the fact that the focus of this game is instilling fear and and terror in the player yeah so that seems like it almost kind of runs counter to that to that ethos uh, and not only that, when you enter an Emmy zone, which again is marked by by you know, specific bespoke doors, uh, the Dread Report says your map registers the layout of the zone and the locations of the zone doors. I guess as soon as you enter, which is uh, which uh. is they say helpful for making important decisions around where to go. But uh, I guess maybe they're worried about it being too punishing because See, you so- know if an Emmy does catch Samus, it's it's instant death unless you you have a very narrow uh, window timing window to counter an Emmy's attack. Otherwise, it's instant death. My counter to that would be that I I think it's fine to have that as an available option, to have the game balanced that way as an option. But I would like an option for more experienced players or those that like a more tense experience to where, okay, give me give me one where the Emmy doors aren't marked and that I don't get the map for the room when I walk into it. And then give me even even on top of that, give me one where Emmy can spawn in any room, you know, save for boss rooms or whatever. And mm-hmm. I, I, you know, you can have that choice to, to basically choose your level of dread. Uh, you know, <laughs> do, you, right. do you want it to be more, more tense and, and atmospheric, the or do you want slider. something that is, that is a bit lighter and, and more akin to like a traditional Metroid game? I'm, I'm okay with either of those, but I, I do wish Nintendo would give us the choice. That said, I am hopeful that we'll get DLC for this game that will, give us an option like that later down the road. I wouldn't mm-hmm. write it off completely yet, but I do wish that it was available on day one because I would choose well, to play it with the Emmys just wherever. The way it makes it sound is that the the Emmy are designed around certain sections of the map. In yeah. Mind. Like they're designed specifically to patrol certain aspects or sections of the map and pursue Samus in specific ways such that you have to use like the new Aeon ability, Phantom Cloak, uh, which they also go into a little bit, which gives her optical camouflage. So it seems as though the Emmy are not designed to be randomly patrolling, but are more designed around certain environmental factors and special abilities that Samus can acquire. And I guess that's not too different from the SAX, but at the same time, the SAX wasn't only in specifically marked areas, and it did truly feel like the SAX could appear anywhere. Now, of course, if you replay Metroid Fusion, the SAX appears in the same rooms and that, you know, at scripted times. But the important thing is that the first time it didn't feel that way. Yep. And the illusion is incredible there where it does truly feel like the SAX is stalking you all the time. And I love that about Fusion. So obviously I'm still really excited about Metroid Dread. I know we both are. And I know Derek is as well. But this does read to me as a little bit disappointing that you kind of know where the fear factor from the Emmy are, are going to come in. Right. And, yeah. and when you're not going to be uh, pursued by one. For sure. As well. Yeah. Um, the, the the report does. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, please, please continue. Uh, there just the report goes on to summarize the the uh, the way in which Samus can ultimately defeat Emmy uh, with the Omega Stream and Omega Blaster uh, moves, which you have to. Uh, she has to charge her blaster at specific locations in an Emmy zone 
to then be able to, you know, have her arm cannon be powerful enough to stop and then destroy an Emmy. And apparently you can only uh, kill an Emmy by first exposing its weak point with the Omega Stream, at which point you have to use the Omega Blaster to shoot the Emmy's exposed weak point as it's approaching you. So there's definitely an element of tension where you can't just, I guess, debilitate it and, and make it, you know, Im immobile. It's still going to be pursuing you as you're trying to destroy it. Hmm. So that's pretty cool. That is cool. Um, and then as kind of a tease at the end, uh, the, there's the question is posed, how, ma how many Emmy are there? And they say the announcement trailer shows several Emmy, including two models that differed in color as well as a broken one. However, uh, this illustration, meaning the key art of the game, shows seven shadows of Emmy behind Samus. It seems there are more kinds of Emmy out there. Uh, and then they tease how each Emmy has different abilities, but they don't go into what abilities those are. And they're going to kind of save that information for later. Nice. Uh, and then they tease us with the subject of Metroid Dread Report Volume 3. And I'm pretty interested in this one. They say seven key words that define Metroid. Please look for it soon. So I'm definitely looking forward to, to the, the third report. Yeah, me too. I, I would be curious to see where that goes. Uh, anyway, with that, we've covered the top five stories from today's and yesterday's news, but mostly today's. Uh, yes. Well, it's the end of the show, and we're actually going to have a post show tonight. So uh, we do have that... one more. Oh yeah, please, that. please go ahead. Okay, so it's a uh, uh, real radic with five Canadian dollars. Thank you so much. Saying Sony poaches Sakurai after he is done with Ultimate to direct the reboot of PlayStation All Stars. I would be so happy, man. I mean, that would be cool, but this man needs a break, man. He, it, yeah, Sakurai I would like to see him kind of flex his creative muscle a bit more. Uh, but mm -hmm. that being said. And I know this will never happen. It's like a dream scenario, but I would love to see some of Nintendo's like most legendary developers just work on different hardware and uh -huh. and see what they could. Because, I mean, they draw so much out of the Switch, which is just such, such an underpowered machine. Honestly, it really is. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing them be, be able to run wild with their ideas on something with like modern horsepower like the PS5, I, I just... It gives me goosebumps thinking about, you know, Miyamoto and Aonuma and all those folks having that kind of power at their fingertips. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, it may also just, you know, it may be a case of where they know it so well because Nintendo does a great job of training them up on, on the hardware. So yeah. uh, it's really debatable if, you know, those same developers, talented though they are, could could pull the same potential out of a system like the PlayStation uh, really depends on developer documentation and a whole lot of other things besides the developer's innate talent. Uh, before we yeah. sign off, Cameron Sharp with a 20-pound donation. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank said, you very much. You said you wanted a Sonic theme park previously. There was one here in the UK called Sonic Spinball. The ride is still there, but the contract with Sega ended. The theming is gone, but there is still a Dr. Eggman partway through. <laughs> Uh, that's cool that is almost like a like an analogy for the current state of 3d sonic <laughs> like, uh -huh. uh, the bones are still there but <laughs> you know right. lots of it is unrecognizable eggman's halfway through it <laughs> but um right. thank you so much for the super chat thank we you. we definitely appreciate it um, and i do want to answer claxon's question really oh, yeah. quick uh, asking do i need some sort of account to become a patron uh you yeah you, you need to uh, sign up with patreon to then uh you know support us on patreon so yeah you do have to create an account on patreon but that's all you have to do and creating an account itself is free so certainly if you know we, we appreciate you being interested go check us out on uh, patreon.com at uh, patreon.com slash gb gaming and as steve kind of said uh at the beginning of the show uh, kind of scaling down how many news stories we cover in, in each episode is a work in progress or trying to kind of trying to find a new groove that gets us done in about an hour so that we can uh, give you know full time to our patron exclusive post show as well, but we're always soliciting feedback. So obviously today we, we talked about five stories for longer, as opposed to eight stories for less time and, and going you know a little bit over late. So it's a work in progress. Please give us your feedback. Let us know what you think. Uh, we're always listening, and that goes for both patrons, of course, as well as those of you on uh, YouTube here. So just wanted to get that out there. But it is a work in progress, and by no, by no means set in stone. Or yeah, absolutely. Well, well said. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that the show works for everyone. That that it's uh, doesn't feel too rushed, doesn't feel too long, <laughs> and and most importantly that we can also get 
everyone onto the post show. I think that's probably the, yes. the big thing that we're trying to fix, right? We want the post show to right. a happen, which it'll it'll always happen no matter how many of us are available. But the goal is to make sure the three of us, you know, being right. myself, Ash, and Derek, are available for it. The last um, couple of times, just just been me, and that's you know, and that's fine. But it's more fun to have all three of us there, and that's the you know, that's what patrons are paying for, and. And we can watch, you know, cursed YouTube videos together and stuff. So we want to make sure that our patron exclusive post show is getting the full, you know, GVG treatment from all three of us and not being treated as, oh, we don't have enough time to do all of us and all that. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Speaking of which, we probably should get to that post show. So, yes, uh, we've reached the end of today's news. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. Uh, as you all know, at the end of episodes like this. Uh, we definitely, you, you know, we need to give a thank you, not just to our subscribers who are watching us here are live on YouTube, those of you that are listening on podcast services all around the world, but especially our patrons. Uh, you guys help us keep the lights on. You help us do what we love to do uh, three times a week here, as well as, you know, your, your support helps us produce all the other stuff that ends up on the channel. <laughs> None of that would be possible without your support. And of course, we have to give an extra special thank you to our patrons at the producer tier. For helping to make this show happen you all know who you are we love you very much apparently i broke our our credit sequence like ash and i are each occupying half of the screen oh no I apologize for the lovecraftian nightmare i've created here for you but anyway we also <laughs> have to give a extra special thank you to our patrons at the executive producer tier and above and those fine folks are jared edinger brandon bovia rob r man x itiono ben dan and twistle dennis j z patty Hyrule Hermit, Sky Blue Flames, Adam O'Sullivan, It's ATM, Octopuppet, Richard Herrera, Michael Phone, Echo Carroll, The D-Pad, Vesmio, Waffle King, Kitty Kong Facts, Angel Martinez, Vedran Hotik, 112, John, Joshua Hunter, Evernight Studio, Benny Yao, Emerald, Azran127, Kenrule09, Pagrema, Jake Pelka, Geller, Shiny Turkey, Joseph Rutkin, Charlie Bird, Geeky Griffin, Lucky Wonderfish, Kyle, Top Dog 23100, Young Ben Kenobi, Doug Shomix, Andrew Medeiros, Orem M, Sakuragi, Becca, Rocks the Cat, Fizzywig Hoyd, Critmonger, The Legend of Groose, Eddie B, Kyed, Kit Fisto, West Egg, Deaneth, Coda, Michael McCaw, Matthew Wong, Goron Amber, Straight Lace, Justin Matthews, Hooby, Wolf X Blake, Moon Macarons, Mega Conrad, Askron 809, Kane, Captain Finlandia, 60 Minutes and 60 Seconds, Christopher Masterson, Spicy Pandotter, The Game Orb, Dano the Artist, Grantles, Ravelox, Synchro Lord, Brainchild, My Mom, Hey Mom, Kotar Peck, Scuff196, Skull Kid Tiger, AJB Cool, Blizzica, Jason Uloa, Jaden Buck, Phantom Project, Lungs and Roses, Darik, Jeff Ed, Ray Clausen Jr., Nathan the Voice Actor, Hulkamaniac55, Chibi J, Bongo Lover, and Mumbling Yeti. Woo! Woo! Well, right. y'all, thank you so, so much for watching. Remember that you too can become a patron over at patreon.com slash gvgaming, where for as little as $5 a month, you can get access to our patron-exclusive post show, which is where we're headed right now. Uh, we'll see y'all in about five minutes for the uh, patron-exclusive post show, but if you're here just for the YouTube portion, thank you so much for watching. Have a great night. Have a wonderful weekend. As always, good night and good vibes. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.